Hi there, my name is Colin Knapp, and I am one of the pastors of this beloved community, Pilgrim Congregational Church. If you're hearing the sound of my voice, that means that you have decided to join us for worship today. It is the second Sunday of Lent, and I am glad that you are here. If you're new or a visitor to Pilgrim Congregational Church, you should know that this is a really special little place. We seek to put our faith into action. We welcome all. We welcome all questions. This is a community committed to one another, committed to Oak Park and our neighborhood. I'm glad that you're here. Without you, we wouldn't be us. Good morning. Welcome to Pilgrim Online Worship Service, the second Sunday in Lent, February 28th, 2021. My name is Ann Platzer, and I am honored to be your liturgist this morning. Welcome this day to the second worship service along our Lenten journey. We come with great hope and expectation as we walk the way of Jesus together in covenant with our God and with each other. Now please join me in an attitude of prayer for our opening prayer. Dear God, we pray that you will make us ready to offer ourselves to you as we begin our worship this morning. The Lenten journey that we are on demands much of us and we need your support to help us through it. Please open our hearts and minds so that we are ready to take on the messages you are sending us and feel your constant love. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now please join Cleo and Marcella in singing the opening hymn, I Want Jesus to Walk With Me. Join me now in our call to confession. Let us confess our sins before God and one another. Holy and all-powerful God, who commands all spirits, comforts those in distress, and casts out destructive forces, we confess that we are unable to do your will. We protect what is familiar and reject what is unknown. We admire those with courage, but excuse ourselves when we falter from the truth. We forget that you are always with us and that with you all things are possible. Forgive us, lead us, make us new. Remove our desire to heed false prophets and show us your way. Amen. And now, my friends, hear the good news. The God who made you and knows your every thought hears you now and forgives all your sin. You have been redeemed through Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior, who is Alpha and Omega, all in all. Good morning, Pilgrim family. I hope that you are having a beautiful and peaceful day. May the peace of Christ be with you. Even with the snow and all this cold, my neighbors still shovel the way to their Virgin Mary. Peace be with you. May the peace of God be with all of you, my pilgrim family. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, wishing you God's strength and peace today. Wishing you peace and comfort and a wonderful 
uh, love filling your days until we can be together again. Peace to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Our first scripture reading from the Old Testament today comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 17. I'll be reading uh, Robert Altler's translation. And Abraham was 99 years old, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai, walk in my presence and be blameless, and I will grant my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you very greatly. And Abram flung himself on his face, and God spoke to him, saying, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be father to a multitude of nations, and no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you father to a multitude of nations, and I will make you most abundantly fruitful and turn you into nations, and kings shall come forth from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you through their generations as an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your seed after you. And God said to Abraham, Sarai, your wife, shall no longer Call her name Sarai, for Sarah is her name. And I will bless her, and I will also give you from her a son, and I will bless him, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall issue from her. This is a word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pilgrim, what do you think when I say the word rules? Do you say boo or do you say yay? I think probably most of you are saying boo to rules, but do you know there's actually people who like rules? They like knowing how everything's going to go. They like to know the right and the wrong answer and for everything to fit within those rules. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't always work out that way, and we'll find out as we go along in our moment this morning. So what kind of things do we need rules for? Well, for instance, if you're playing a game like the Pixar Uno here, it's important to know the rules. And boy, there are a lot of rules to know on that so that everybody plays fair with that. How about with traffic? be a little chaotic if we didn't have rules for that. Speed limits, stop lights and stop signs, knowing which side of the road to drive on. There'd be a lot of accidents, wouldn't there, if we didn't have those kind of rules. And how about in your classroom or your Zoom classroom now? You have to have rules about raising your hand and with Zoom muting and staying in your seat and other rules that your teacher might have. Those, of course, are all important rules. Today, our scripture story comes from Genesis, and also it's retold in Romans. It's the story of how God comes to Abraham and tells, them that, tells him that he and Sarah are going to have a baby, but they're a hundred years old. That doesn't seem to follow the rules, does it? Hmm. Well, let's see. God has given us a lot of rules, hasn't he, in the Bible? We have, for example, the Ten Commandments that Moses brought down from the mountainside. We have the golden rule, do unto others as you wish for them to do unto you. Those are good rules. But with faith, rules don't always work all the time. The problem with holding on tightly to those rules and wanting everything to fit within the right and wrong is that life doesn't always go that way, does it? 
Sometimes sad things and bad things happen, even though we're following the rules. Or in the case of our story today, something joyous happens outside of the rules for Abraham and Sarah. God said to Abraham in our scripture today, it would not come to him because he followed the law. This wonderful thing would come to him because he followed his faith in God. So when things in our lives, the sad things and the bad things happen, that's where our trust and hope comes. Our trust and hope that we have in God to carry us through those times where they don't fit within the rules because those times will happen. So I want you to take away today, of course, we want you to follow the rules that we have here on earth the best that you can. But when those don't work, I want you to have three keeps, I'm calling them. So our three keeps for today are keep trusting in God, keep hoping, keep your hope, and keep loving yourself and loving one another. Because remember, God is always in control. Let us pray. Hold my hand, God. Lead the way. Help me be good every day. Let me know what's wrong and right. Keep me safe day and night. Let me know what you have planned. Lead the way, God. Hold my hand. Today our New Testament reading is from the Book of Romans, uh, chapter 4, verses 13 to 25. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words it was reckoned to him were written not only for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. What does it mean to be in relationship with God? What is the nature of this mysterious connection? To put it more precisely, what is the mechanism through which we stay with God? When I first became a Christian at the age of 15, I went to a conservative Pentecostal church now, I know that may surprise a lot of you, and the more I think about it, the more it surprises me too, but the how and why of that fact are a story for another sermon. I attended this church, which I would now characterize as a, a fundamentalist evangelical congregation, and in that worship service, which in theory rejected formal liturgy and scripted movements and words that were 
written down ahead of time. There was, however, definitely an order to the service. It included every Sunday an altar call. The minister would chasten us to the front where we would bend our knees, lean against the altar railing, pray the sinner's prayer. For being a church that prided itself on the spontaneous movements of the Holy Spirit, we prayed word for word that same prayer every single week. And my friend and I, we would get saved and resaved every Sunday before we went out into the world and got lost all over again. And for six months, that was sort of the, the cycle of my spiritual journey. Lost, saved, lost, saved. All sort of dependent upon me praying this prayer. I held it so tightly. For those in the church that I went to, what it meant to be in relationship with God, the nature of that connection, the mechanism by which we stay with God, was really simple. You prayed the prayer. You went to church on Sunday. You spoke in tongues. You did these things. These were the visible signs of your salvation. And you must display those signs because after all, we were told again every week that a good tree must bear good fruit. These were the hard and fast rules of the game. And these rules were strictly held to. It was straightforward and easy to understand. And as a new Christian, I liked that I knew exactly where I stood with God based upon my actions or inactions. It was implied, but, but never actually spoken, that my relationship to God was something that I did. It was the result of my actions. It was about me following the rules. Hmm. In the United Church of Christ, we still have rules, but it is fair to say that we do things a bit differently here in this congregation. We are heavily influenced by the theology of the Reformation, which in turn takes quite a bit from the story of Abraham and Sarah, which we read today from the book of Genesis. It is a story that is centered around this concept that we call covenant. If my favorite theology professor from undergrad were here, he would tell you with an uncanny type of glee that a covenant is a contract. Which is true, uh, but also a little tack turn. I mean, if we're being honest, nobody really wants to sign a contract with God. Contracts have stipulations and clauses and fancy language that require a, a degree to interpret. Contracts have rules. Contracts don't speak to the freedom and, and intimate belonging that each of us really crave. It's like falling in love, only to find yourself being presented with a prenup. Luckily, a covenant cannot really be boiled down to this legalistic notion of a contract because what a covenant really is, is a promise. In my son's storybook Bible, which I really enjoy reading to him, even though I, most, I know he mostly just likes to look at the pictures and point at the colors, it says God told Abram about his secret rescue plan. I like that. God's promise that God would rescue the world through Abram's family. In other words, through this covenant, God initiates God's plan of reconciliation. 
This is a promise of blessing and keeping, a promise of a future beyond what seems possible, beyond what the rules say are even plausible. Remember, Abram and Sarai are well beyond their childbearing years. This is a promise of grace. Promises like this are, are made to be received. They cannot be achieved or earned. And so it happens on God's terms, not our own. God comes to Abram and Sarai, comes to us first. This is grace. And grace doesn't play by the rules. The only thing that they are told to do, actually, if you look closely, is to keep the covenant. Verse 2 says to be blameless. Now I know that we could conjure up all sorts of nasty notions about what it means to be blameless. But when you actually unpack the word and you, you look at it in the context of the story, what it simply means is to practice faithfulness and trust. It does not imply a life of perfection. Rather, we are to live by faith. We believe God more than our eyes can see. And so more than a God who is concerned with signs and symbols and checking boxes and doing all the right things at exactly the right time, what I see is a God who comes and changes the rules. The rules say Sarai is barren, but God promises descendants beyond any rational measure. The rules say your old life is almost over, but God promises a whole new life is about to begin. This is an everlasting promise, and the mark of that promise is the giving of new names. Abram becomes Abraham. Sarai becomes Sarah. Even the very name for God has changed. El Shaddai. This is the first time we read of that in Scripture. The rules have changed. Millard Fuller passed away several years ago now. I believe it was 2009. He was the founder of Habitat for Humanity. You know that program. It's the remarkable program for building houses for the homeless that is spread across the globe. In 1965, Millard Fuller was a rules person. He was a hard-working Manhattan executive putting in 100 hours a week at work, making the unheard of sum of a million dollars a year. He was young, smart, had climbed every possible ladder. He had every possible resume virtue that one could want or need. In the words of David Brooks, he had climbed the tallest peaks of that first mountain. And from the outside, he was playing by the rules, and he was winning. But from the inside, he was dying. His life was crumbling around him. His children didn't know who he was. One evening, his wife announced she was leaving. He felt as though he was losing his soul. He was clinging so hard to something that he thought he wanted. The things that really mattered in his life had slipped right through his grasp. In a desperate attempt to put his life back together again, he piled his wife and children in the car and drove down to Americus, Georgia to meet with some friends who had recently joined this thing called Koinonia Farms, 
a community where rich folks and poor, poor folks and black folks and white folks, they all lived together in the still segregated South, breaking the rules. He met with Clarence Jordan, founder of the community who listened to Fuller's pain and splintered life and suggested that a million dollars a year is an awful burden to carry. Fuller stayed for a month, saw what was happening at Koinonia Farms, began reading the Bible, caught a new vision. Putting his remarkable business savvy to work, he started Habitat for Humanity. And well, the rest is history. Like Abram and Sarai, like the first Christians, he was a rules guy, playing by the rules only to discover that the rules didn't lead him somewhere that he wanted to go. In the words of Jesus, he had to lose his life in order to save it. And so that leads me to another question. What would it mean for you to lose your life of rules, for you to lose your life of achieving today? I know that's how many of us got here to Oak Park. We played by the rules. We did all the right things. It would probably be terrifying at first. I get that. But what we would soon discover is a new life of grace, a new life of receiving, a life lived in gratitude and simplicity, a life we could freely offer to another person without the fear of being diminished, without the fear of not receiving what was due to us what we felt entitled to. We could learn to be more open. Our faith, this relationship to God that we have, our very life, these things are ultimately a gift. It's something we receive. It is not something we earn by some deep striving. God offers us a promise today. Are we going to receive it or are we going to keep insisting that we somehow earn it by playing by whatever rules we currently think are in vogue? Are we going to keep insisting that other folks play by these same rules before they can have a seat at God's table? I have to be honest, it doesn't seem to me that God is super interested in a lot of rules to follow before God promises the blessing of all blessings, an everlasting covenant that we are the inheritors of by faith. What if we just tried to let that be today. In this season of Lent, which is a slow but sure march to the darkness of the shadow of the cross, we are reminded of the centrality of the promise of blessing and keeping, of new names and new life. The promise that begins with Abraham and Sarah extends into the fullness of the life of Jesus. It extends into the death of Jesus. It extends into the resurrection of Jesus. It is the promise of our baptism when we are told of our 
new identities, that we are these beloved children of God. It's this promise that cannot be torn by our woundedness, cannot be hemmed in by our rules, rendered inept by our failing, because it does not depend on us. God is the way in which we stay with God. Thanks be to God. In the name of the triune God, amen.
I invite you now to join me in prayer. You're welcome to share your prayer joys and concerns online during this service in the chat, remembering that those will be available for public viewing. Alternatively, you can submit prayers privately through our website or contact a deacon for healing prayer by phone. Today's prayer is responsive. When I say, Lord, hear our prayer, I invite you to respond and in your love, answer. Please pray with me. God, in whom we live and move and have our being, there is nothing that separates us from you, your grace, and your love. We give you thanks for the example of Abraham and for all the saints who have gone before us, for those who waited in patience for your promises to come to pass, for those who lived in hope while around them it seemed to be only darkness. Sometimes, Lord, it's so hard to trust you that to trust that you are at work around and within us. So we come asking for some blessed assurance of your comforting presence and abiding peace. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would make us bold in our faith. Help us to place our trust and our lives in your care. Give us the strength and courage that we need for the journey that you have called us to. Be with us now and always. Lord, hear our prayer and in your love answer. Lord, the United States has surpassed 500,000 deaths related to the coronavirus. God, we ask that you come to the side of everyone mourning the loss of a loved one. We ask for prayers for the children and family of Isabel who passed away with COVID and for her husband Moises who is on a ventilator. Come to the side of weary caregivers and healthcare workers. Come to nursing homes where people have been living in isolation. Come to schools trying to find ways to safely teach children while this virus is still in our midst. Come to the laboratories of scientists as they learn more about this virus, its variants. Come to all the places where vaccinations are being administered. Come to all who anxiously are waiting for their vaccination. Come to all who are too afraid to leave their homes. Come to all who do not have the choice to stay at home or a place to call home. Lord, hear our prayer and in your love answer. We pray, O oh Lord, for those in our family, our church, our community, and our world that you would bring to our hearts and minds at this time and we hold them up to you. We ask for prayers of healing, comfort and grace for those who are hurting. Shal, Benny the third and his family, people in Texas and others struggling to recover from recent weather related disasters. We pray for justice and mercy for all who suffer due to unjust systems of discrimination and oppression, including Emiliano, Arnold, Marco, Roni, Alberto and Luis. We offer prayers of gratitude for the opportunity to celebrate life for Mary's 75th birthday, for Renee's and Kelsey's 27th birthdays, for the baptism of Joan and Norm's granddaughter, Olivia, for the improving health of Delina's Aunt Carol and Leslie's mother, Connie, for scientists and successful space exploration and the increasing availability of COVID-19 vaccines. We pray for these dear ones who are close to our hearts that we lift up to you now, either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Lord, hear our prayer and in your love answer. 
Loving God, you are our hope. We have often lived as though you were so distant, so uninvolved with us, and so aloof. Yet in Christ you have shown us how near to us you are, walking by our sides, risking all to be near to us. And you are here in this very moment as constant presence, insistent voice, and loving hearer of our prayers. Holy One, we ask that you continue to be our hope, hope that draws us past our limits, hope that defies expectations, hope that questions what we have known, hope that makes a way where there is none, hope that blesses those to come. May we see you, hear you, and know you as we move through this Lenten season, even as we pray as Jesus has taught us, each praying in the words most familiar to us. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the time in our service that we offer to God a portion of what God has given to us. You are invited to give to Pilgrim Congregational Church using any of the methods uh, that I will explain. Online at pilgrimoakpark.org, select Giving from the menu or click the Give to Pilgrim button via the Tithely app downloaded from your phone's app store. Text the word GIVE to 833-721-1098 or mail a check to the church office. At this time, we ask that you give generously as you are able. God of great wonders, we join with you in the joy of giving. You give us life and breath. You fill the world with beauty, our hands with bounty, and our hearts with the desire to give. Accept these gifts and ourselves in your service. Amen. I have several announcements for you this morning. In October of last year, the Sacred Conversations on Race Committee launched the Action for Racial Justice Be Bold campaign.
From that effort, several groups formed around specific racial justice themes, and next Sunday, two of those groups invite you to join them for special events. During the 9 a.m. adult enrichment class, members of the Be Bold Criminal Justice Group will share what has been happening in the areas of criminal justice reform in the state of Illinois and in the city of Chicago. They will discuss what they have learned as they have worked to support progress in both arenas. Later that same day, next Sunday, from 1 to 2.30 p.m., the Be Bold Immigration Group invites you to participate in a virtual simulation of being a refugee family fleeing for its life. The program, Freeing for Your Life, will be facilitated by Exodus World Service on Zoom and is appropriate for adults and youth middle school ages and up. There is no fee for attending, but you must pre-register by contacting the office. You can email us at office at pilgrimoakpark.org. That's office at pilgrimoakpark.org. And more information on both these programs can be found on our website. Pastor Colin and Bobby Hall invite you to join them via Zoom for a brief service of evening prayer this Tuesday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. It's a really nice opportunity to reflect and wind down from the day. The Zoom link is available on our website. If you have a moment this week to record a new Passing of the Peace video, we would love to have you do so. Please send your video to Delena so that it can be shared during our worship service. Immediately following today's service, everyone is invited to join us for a brief time of fellowship on Zoom. The link is posted on our website. And now, please join Sherry Ambrose, Janine Bergen, Rosemary Phillips, and Marsha Holmes in singing the closing hymn, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary.
are all ministers of God. We all sing unto the Lord. And we don't care how we sound. But it sounds sweet when it gets to his ears. So I want you to sing it with me now. Ready? Lord, prepare it. Lord, prepare me. Lift your voice. my sisters and brothers, receive this good news. God offers us promise. It's a promise of grace. It's a promise of new life. Receive it today on your Lenten journey. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.